while they're in the children's church, if you'll find in Revelation, you'll find your place in Revelation chapter two. In the back of the book, we're going to be in Revelation chapter two, and uh, we're going to read this morning verses eight through eleven. Revelation chapter two, verses eight through eleven. And uh, today's message, as it goes with the series that we're in, living in twenty twenty. Remember, we're, we're taking uh, the current situation, the circumstances that we find ourselves and we're taking the Word of God and applying it to uh, uh, the place that we are. Today's message is going to be titled, uh, How to Be a Christ Follower or Being a Christ Follower in 2020. Being a Christ Follower in 2020. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 8. The Apostle John wrote, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. By the way, if it's written in red, Jesus is saying it. So these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works. I know your tribulation and your poverty. But you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall be not hurt by the second death. Being a Christ follower in 2020. How, how is that to happen? How is a Christian, a disciple, a follower of Jesus to live in this time? That's the question that, that we're going to ponder this morning as we look into God's Word for guidance. Now, in college education... Uh, a student can choose to enroll in a course as a true student, or they can enroll in a course uh, by way of audit. You can audit a class. Now, when you audit a course, uh, you get the opportunity to learn the subject matter of the course, but there's really no responsibility outside of the learning. Okay, you can go to class, you, you can hear the lectures, you can get the notes, but you don't have to do any of the homework because you're just observing the class. You're just auditing the class. You don't have any tests. You don't have any quizzes. You don't have a final exam. You don't have a midterm. You don't have any term papers. You don't even have to, to go to class. You don't even have to, to attend uh, uh, because, well, you're, you're not truly a part of the class. You're just auditing the class. Now, now that might seem interesting to you who are afraid of, of higher education or going to school again. That might seem in intriguing uh, to those nervous about taking a class. You know, auditing might not be so bad. But, but I need for you to understand that you can go to a class every single day by way of audit. And, and you can get all the notes. You can have all the experiences of being in the class. But you don't get credit for taking the class. You're just an observer. Okay? You get the information. But there's really no responsibility. Uh, and, and a lot of times, those who audit the class, they want the information, they want the knowledge about the subject, they, they don't really plan to do anything with it beyond that, though. Uh, a lot of times that happens in the Christian life. You, you know something? You can't, all, you can't audit the Christian life. You, you can't do it. You can't coast through the Christian life. But, but what many people do... What many people do is they, they come to the church and, and, and they come to worship service and they, they, they hear the Word of God. They like to be inspired by the Word of God, uh, but they don't plan to do anything in response to it. They, they, they like to get the information, they like to have the head knowledge, but they refuse to be transformed. And, and listen, when you try to audit the Christian life, you hear the Word, you might be inspired by the Word, you might be encouraged by the Word, but the danger is you don't act upon the Word. Therefore, your heart isn't being changed by the Word. Because transformation in the Christian life is activated by obedience. Without it, it's just information, but there's no credit. There's no transforming Word. God has a major issue with part-time Christians who don't want to be full-time followers, full-time saints, God has an issue with, with fair-weather Christians, so to speak. 
You've heard the term fair weather fan before, right? You know, that, that, that's somebody who's only a supportive for their team when things are going really good. I've got a buddy, and, and the Lord knows who he is. He knows his heart, too. He's far from the Lord. But, but he's an NC State Wolfpack fan. I only know like three of them. And, and most of them, most of them are saying to begin with because they're NC State Wolfpack fans. But, but listen, he'll only get in touch with me through a season, okay? If, in fact, North Carolina State happens to upset North Carolina, it happens like once every 10 years. It doesn't really shake us. It happens from time to time. But this person will be the first to say, go pack. And you never hear from him for the rest of the year. I, I got my win. I'm a fair weather fan. Can't stand it in sports. And I think about our Lord Jesus. I know he's not pleased at all with fair weather Christians who think that they can audit through their relationship with God. Those who identify with Jesus when life is blessed and happy, but not when it comes to struggle. Those are the ones who are auditing the Christian life, so to speak. Yes, it's easy to follow Jesus when everything's going my way, right? It's easy to follow Jesus when, when God is answering all of my prayers. As it seems, it's easy when, when, uh, when the benefits of heaven are just raining down on me. But when the troubles that come with being a cross of Christ follower on earth, when they come, that's when I, I, I retreat. That's called an auditing Christian. I, I think there are some who do not believe at all that a Christian should ever go through troublesome times or hardships or pain or loss or suffering of any kind. But folks, that is simply not true. It's not true. Christians are not promised to be free from troubles. Christians are not promised to have uh, to not have hardships. Christians are not are not promised to not have trials or tribulations or even or even experience loss. As a matter of fact, we are told to prepare for trouble, to prepare for hardship, to prepare for struggles, to to prepare for loss. But the difference is. We know that Jesus, the Lord, is with us through them. I mentioned this last Sunday momentarily, but I think it needs to be stated again today. All of us, all of us, regardless of whether we're a Christian or not, all of us understand pain. We all know what it's like to hurt. We all know what it's like to, to go through suffering and, and trials. Anguish is anguish. Pain is pain. Tears are tears. We all know what it's like to hurt. We all know what it's like to grieve. We all know what it's like to cry. And, and as I said last week, you might express your sorrow in, in difficult times in different ways. But for the Christian, we are sorrowful but for a season. Because our hope is in Jesus. Our, our hope is different than that of the world. Even when the situation looks bleak, even when the darkness may come and uncertainty tries to, to blur your spiritual vision, Jesus is our hope. And He's our steadfast anchor. Christians believe that suffering has a specific purpose in God's sovereign plan. And, and God has a way in hurtful times, in trying times. God has a way of purifying us. God has a way of perfecting us. God has a way, a, 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 an amazing way of showing us His glory and Himself in times of loss and hardship than, than we would ever know, than we wouldn't know if we didn't go through them. But we know this, He will carry us in the trials. The question is though, will we be faithful to follow Him through difficult dark days? Or will we merely audit the course called the Christian life? Today we're in Revelation 2. And to give you background, we, we've studied this letter in full before. Uh, this this letter written to seven churches in, in Asia Minor. But the Apostle John wrote it. The Apostle John was now 60 years past his time with Jesus. So he's now an old man. He's well into his 90s. And, and, and he's, he's experienced ministry with Jesus before. John had a first-hand experience. The Apostle John lived with Christ, walked with Christ, did ministry with Christ. John the Apostle saw Jesus live. John, Paul, or John, the apostle, saw Jesus die. And here's something neat about the apostle John. John saw the risen Christ. John got to experience that. Uh, and, and that witness, he, he was given a commission from Christ to preach the word, as you are, as I am, to, to proclaim the word of God throughout the world. And his witness was so powerful. John's witness was so powerful that it caused him to be banished. John was punished. For his faith. That, that's what he earned. He, he, he worked so hard for the Lord. He witnessed for the Lord. Shared the gospel faithfully. Ministered to people. And it earned him banishing to an island called Patmos. And you're like, how is that a good thing? 
to, to be banished, to be exiled. Well, while he was worshiping the Lord there in exile, the Lord Jesus encounters John and gives him this book, gives him this revelation, the book of Revelation. And John the Apostle was invited to write seven churches there in Asia Minor. You've heard of them, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And John was commissioned to write to them the things that will soon take place. And, and, and so in, in the book of Revelation, you see the risen Christ in the glory of heaven. You also hear about the coming judgment that is to come on the earth. You also hear about and read about those who are going to stand in stark opposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about Satan. We're talking about the Antichrist and, and, and the false prophet. But then you also know that many nations are going to rise up against the Lord Jesus as well. But we know how it is. Christ has the victory. And, and, and Jesus comes again. And Jesus reigns on this earth. And we get to see the final judgment uh, of mankind and what that entails. But the most beautiful picture of the revelation is that we get a picture of what heaven on earth is going to be like. With the Lord Jesus. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, a lot of times people are, are intimidated by it. A lot of times people are confused or, or some are entertained uh, to, to what the message actually means with the wrong intentions. But actually, these words that were written, they were written to churches. This is a letter to the church. Okay, because they, in, in the time in which they lived, yes, John spends a good bit of time talking about future things. But in this letter, John deals with what's going on in the believer's life presently. These were real churches in real places that really did exist, okay, in history, going through real struggles. And, and so John writes to these churches and, and he's saying to them, I really want you to have your head and your heart pointing upward because our redemption is coming soon. And, and he says, you're in difficult times, uh, uh, but you need to pray unto the Lord and look to Him uh, to come again because He is. And so John writes these things down. And here we are. Uh, one of the churches that he addressed was the church at Smyrna. Everyone say Smyrna. Okay, so we get the word myrrh from the word Smyrna. And myrrh was a spice, myrrh was a perfume that was crushed to, to bring about a, a fragrance, a, a great smell, a sweet smell. It was actually used to prepare the dead. And Smyrna was an important seaport city in Asia Minor, Minor where John the Apostle was exiled. And in John's day, uh, Smyrna was a, was a thriving seaport city. Uh, as a matter of fact, they had a stadium, they had a library, they had a theater... They had about half a million people living there in, in, in the days of John in the first century. Life in Smyrna was not easy at all for the believer, for Christians. Christians were familiar with the pressure to worship the emperor Domitian. Okay, there was a lot of pressure on them to worship Caesar rather than to worship Jesus. There was also, there was also pressure... For, for the Christians uh, uh, that came from the Jewish population because the Jews were committed to their tradition, to their religion, and, and, they were, and they were trying to say that Jesus isn't the Son of God. Jesus isn't the Messiah. You've got it all wrong. And so they had pressure coming from the Jews and from the Romans as well. The Romans would have persecuted them for, for, for refusing to worship the emperor. The Jews would have rejected the Christians because they refused. Uh, the Jews re rejected Jesus as the Son of God. And, and so, the, the Smyrna Christians were crushed. They were persecuted for their faithfulness. But the Lord was pleased with that. The Lord was glorified in that. The Gospel progressed because of that. And Jesus let them know in this letter, I see your faithfulness. I note your faithfulness. You're following me even in troublesome times. And, and folks, here we are. 2,000 years later, Reading the same letter. And the promise is the same. We should be prepared for difficult times ahead. We should be prayerful. But we should not lose sight of the purpose that God has for our lives. Regardless of what happens in the world. Now um, I, I understand that, that many of your hearts may be troubled today. And, and hurt today. And tempted to uh, be distracted today by what has happened this past week 
in our country. Some, some are really excited about the election. Some are, are, are not excited about the election. And believe me, I, I'm with you. This week has been sw it's hard to swallow for me personally uh, in our country. I, I was shocked, honestly, by the outcome of this week's election. The result was not as I prayed for. The result was not as I hoped for. And in more ways than just who's president, our, our nation, here's what shocks me the most. Our nation continues to go unchanged. Right? It appears that the division is deeper than it was four years ago. It, it, it appears that the country grows more in a progressive state of liberalism. It means open-mindedness and tolerating of sin. And, and, and our country will reap the consequences thereof. But as a Christian living here in 2020, we realize more than ever, we realize that the United States is just a temporary home. And, and, and we're blessed to live here. But listen, the U.S.'s days are numbered. Our Lord Jesus is coming again. And when He does, the U.S. is nothing but a footnote in the epic scheme of things. All right? But as long as we have breath, we still have a mission to accomplish. As long as we have been given life, our hope is in Christ, our future is in heaven, but until He comes again, we must go, we must witness in His name, we must be faithful to His Word, we must stand firm in the faith, you must not give up, give out, or give in, we must continue to draw upon the strength of the Lord Jesus and stand on the Word of God and be faithful unto Him no matter what goes on here. And, and God forbid... God forbid that we ever place our trust more in the politicians and leaders who ride upon the backs of elephants and donkeys because our hope is in the line of the tribe of Judah. We look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who conquered death, hell, and the grave and has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, who's given us a spirit who has equipped us to be effective and powerful for the glory of God. And so don't hang your head this week. Don't lose hope. I've had my moments or two this week. I and God has gotten my, my head. Uh, I got I to move on. God, God has got my attention and has reminded me. I know. I knew this would happen. The truth comes out. Trust God with the results. But Peter, you be good. You do good. You, you minister to people. You monitor before the world what a citizen of heaven looks like. You be respectful and prayerful for the nation's leaders. And trust in Jesus to change the hearts of people. But don't you dare compromise your faith for a second. Count it all joy if you must suffer persecution. And if you must go through trials. And if you must go through a season of national judgment and chastisement from the Lord. You be faithful in everything that He's called you. That's what He's challenged my heart to this week. Be commendable in the faith. As the believers were in Smyrna. Now, in this letter, John, uh, the apostle, shares with us three directions of what a follower of Jesus is to do in this year 2020. And I want, for, I want to share with you these things this morning. Actually, it wasn't John who shared these things. It was Jesus himself who shared these things. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Christ followers, true followers of Jesus, know who their Lord is. True followers of Jesus know who their Lord is. I want you to pay attention, okay, to verse 8 right here. Uh, it says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? By the way, this is Jesus giving instruction to John to tell the church at Smyrna these things. And it says, write to the angel of the church of Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead, but who has now come to life. I love this. John reminds his readers, I'm giving you the message, but Jesus is the one doing the talking. Okay, so folks, let, let's keep this in mind today. If you get mad or have been mad at anything that is said today, just give it to Jesus, talk to Jesus about it, leave me alone, okay? But because I, I'm giving you the word of the Lord. Don't shoot the messenger, John says. I didn't write this, Jesus did. I didn't say this, Jesus did. Because he told John to say it and to write it down, what he was relaying to say to this church. And Jesus begins by reminding the church, and I pray that you're reminded of this as well. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Jesus begins by saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who was dead, but is now alive. We will do really well today, folks, to remember who our Lord is. 
who our Lord is. He's the first and the last. He's the one who is dead, but is now alive. Now, that may not sound like much to you, but let's consider what God is saying of Himself in this text. By the way, in Isaiah 41, 4, Isaiah 44, 6, and, and Isaiah 48, verses 12 through 13, you read before the days of Jesus, God Himself said that He is the Lord Almighty. He is the first and He is the last. He says to, to of Himself, I'm the first and the last. I'm the God who created the heavens and the earth. So when Jesus here in this text says, thus said the first and the last, when Jesus declares Himself to be first and last, He's declaring Himself to be God. He's saying, don't forget who's the Lord of the church. He says, I'm from everlasting. I was here in the beginning. As a matter of fact, I was here before the beginning. And I will be here in the end. And I'll be here after the end. He says in this verse, I am both God and I am both men. He says, I'm the first and the last. But he also says, I am the one who died. I am of deity and I'm also of humanity. I'm the first and last. I am forevermore. I am God. But he says, I was dead. I died. How did Jesus die? Tell me, how did Jesus die, folks? On the cross. Jesus died on the cross. But He says, I, I, I didn't stay dead. I'm alive. I, I, I am man. One of the things you need to understand in life is that Jesus never goes oops about what happens here. Think about that. That is truth. Jesus is never surprised by what is happening in the world. He's fully aware. So if the church is struggling in the fight... If the church is going through persecution and pain, if the church is crying out, if they are being challenged and they're being tempted by the enemy, he's aware of it. Jesus is aware of it. He knows it. He says, I'm fully aware of it. I'm God. I'm the first and the last. But he says, also, also know what it's like to die. I'm man. If you feel like you're dying, he says, I, I know what it's like to die. I have died. I've been through all the categories of trouble that, that any human being has went through. I know what it's like to feel loss. I know what it's like to feel pain. I know what it's like to feel suffering. I, I know what it's like to be persecuted. Jesus is saying to this church here, I am the first and the last. I am the one who died. I, I know what it's like. I, I know what it's like to be troubled. If you're hurt today, Jesus is aware of it. But he also sees beyond it because he's the first and the last. He's not just man. He's also God. Now, something interesting about the, uh, the ancient city of Smyrna is that it was surrounded by mountains. Okay, and those mountains were shaped like a crown. And their buildings and their monuments were often built to reflect this mountain look of a crown. And the reason why this is such a big deal is because as a Roman colony, the city of Smyrna worshipped Caesar as king. They worshipped Caesar as lord. The emperor as God. The emperor as lord. As a matter of fact, it may have been mandated. That the people worship and bow down to the emperor. Here's the thing about the Christians though in John's day. These Christians had another declaration. These Christians had another Lord. These Christians had another God. Jesus is Lord they said. Jesus is Savior. And that created a conflict with the Romans. They were going through. The, the Smyrna Christians were going through the pressure and the consequences of not claiming governmental authority as the Lord. They were calling Jesus Lord instead of Caesar. And while everybody else around them might have been saying, no, Caesar is Lord, they were saying, no way, Jesus is Lord. Now, while we recognize and we respect government, folks, we don't bow down to government. Because Jesus is not Caesar. Jesus is is Lord. And that created a problem because once you rejected Caesar, you became an enemy of the state. Jesus says in verse 9, He says, I know your trouble. I know your affliction. He says, I know your poverty. You know, it's bad enough to be in trouble, but, but it's tougher being in trouble with no money. All right? And, that, and that's where it, get, it gets where it hurts. With money, you know, you, you can hide how messed up your life is when, when you've got money. You can cover up tribulation you're going through with entertainment and comfort, food and pleasure. And, 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 and you can satisfy it to your heart's content. You can hide your hurt, so to speak. You can pacify your hurt. But when, when that is gone, 
When that, mon when that money is gone, when that physical comfort is gone, your hurt really shows. Your pain and your trouble really show out. The Christians in Smyrna had declared Jesus as Lord and they were now impoverished financially. You know what happens? When they declared Jesus to be Lord and the emperor found out about it, they took their businesses. They looted their stores. They rioted the streets, so to speak. They lost their financial status in the community because of their witness for Christ and their unwillingness to compromise their dedication and declaration in front of Rome that you're not God, but Jesus is. Jesus is our God. Jesus is our Lord. But the Lord Jesus in this moment, He says, I commend you in that. That's a surprise, isn't it? You're blessed because of this. Sure, you may have nothing financially. You may have nothing at all physically. But on this earth and, and before heaven and before Christ, you are rich, Jesus says. I know of your trouble. I, I know of your hardship. I know of your struggle. But you are rich. Even though you have great poverty on this earth, you are rich. You are rich because of your decision to be committed to Christ, even though it is costing you a price. You are rich because you're professing me. You are rich because you're proclaiming me. You're not ashamed of me. You are rich because you're exalted. You're exalting me in the face of a wicked governor. And you are richer in spiritual blessing and standing in heaven and before heaven. You are richer in glory than you'll ever be if you're at the top of the world in wealth and riches and fame. Jesus says you are rich in your struggle and your suffering. And, and, and may I say this today. We are getting to the place in America where if you publicly declare the Lord Jesus, if you declare the Lord Jesus, if you declare that Jesus is God, that Jesus is King, that Jesus is, is Lord, not Democrats, not Republicans, not the White House, not Congress, not the President, not the Governor. If you declare that Jesus is Lord, you may see. Some of that persecution, some of that pain that even Smyrna experienced. If you go into this culture today and you say, Jesus is Lord. He makes the decisions for the church. He drives the church. He holds the keys in the church. He's the foundation of the church, not the governing officials. We are getting to the place in America where we have set ourselves up for an attack that has already begun. We live in a day where proclaiming Jesus may cost you freedom that you thought you were entitled to. It may cost you financially in the future. It may cost you a place in the world in the future. But that's my, not my point. My point is the church needs to understand and remember that even though there indeed may be trouble, we're not exempt from it. Re that regardless of what the church may face, regardless of what Caesar may say, regardless of what the government may mandate and force the country to do, the church's allegiance is not to Washington. The church's allegiance is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ. Christ, the Son of God who gave His life for us. Now, I'm not encouraging resistance. Don't you hear me wrong today? And I'm not stirring up rebellion. We don't go looking for trouble in the United States, but I'm calling you to remember who your Lord is. He's the first He's the last. He's the one who lived and died but rose again. The one who has power over life and death and eternity. That's our King. That's our Lord. That's our Christ. My question is this morning, is He Lord to you? Is He your Savior? Because if He is, this has a direct impact on your life. Just as it did for the church at Smyrna some 2,000 years ago. If Jesus were only God, if Jesus were only God, then He would have appeared to be separated from what was going on in the world. He wouldn't understand the human experiences that we are facing and the struggling and the strife and the suffering and trouble that others go through. If Jesus were only man and not God, then, then His death would have been just another martyr. He would have just been a, a good man. A, a good man who died with a cause. But listen, Jesus is more than that. Jesus was more than a good man. He was more than a victim on the cross who faced a tragic death. Jesus says, I'm the first I am the last. I'm the one who is dead, but now has come to life. He is fully God. He's fully man. And we can take comfort today in knowing that we don't follow just a man. We follow the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you be comforted in that today? He's the eternal one who chose to dwell in, in time with us. So he understands you. He understands who you are. He understands what you're going through. He also knows where you're headed. 
when we pray, when we worship, when we live our lives in this difficult, uncertain, chaotic world in which we find ourselves, we have King Jesus who is Lord over all. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Christ followers in 2020 know who their Lord is. I want to share the second thing with you. Christ followers know who to look to in times of trouble. In, in verses 9 and 10, Jesus says, I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. He says, but I know also that you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews, but they're not. They're actually the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Jesus says two things here to his followers. Look to me in faithfulness. And look to me in fearlessness. Be fearless. Be faithful. I want you to imagine yourself. Let's, let's go backwards. Let's go 2,000 years into first century Smyrna. Okay, Let, let's say that uh, the church has gathered together in someone's home. They didn't have fancy buildings like this back, back then. So let's say that you're in first century Smyrna. It's a cold morning before sunrise. And, and let's say that we've gathered into a house uh, for, for worship. God's people are gathering in a house and, and, and they're beaten and they're broken and they're stressed and, and they're struggling. And, and you know what? You, you look at the group of the people that morning and, and, and they were once a lively crowd of Christians. But now many people have stepped away from the faith that there's not as many in the house many have counted the cost and they said you know what the, the struggle's too much uh, the persecution's too much I, I love Jesus but I, I just can't follow Jesus I, I've got to turn back I love to follow Jesus in this life but, but I can't it costs me way too much and, and so some have fallen away in first century Smyrna due to, due to the persecution there are others in the church family who have, who have, who have left the church because they've been arrested <laughs> They, they've been exiled. They've been even. They've been executed, and so some have risked their very lives by gathering together to meet and to pray and to sing hymns to God and to worship. Well, as the worship service progresses, just imagine this with me: the messenger comes, and uh, your heart is expectant. Your heart is hopeful, and, and the preacher in first century Smyrna unrolls a scroll, and he reads the very words that you have read this morning in verses eight through ten. But listen to this. The one who's writing this church, the one who's speaking to this church is not their pastor. It's not some author, a, a popular author, some author of self-help, someone who's just trying to cheer folks up and give them a pat on the back. No, the person that is reaching them and comforting their hearts is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And He's calling them through everything to look to Him. And Jesus says to the church in this text, I know your tribulation. I know you're hurt. I know your poverty. But realize today, you are rich. The Lord says to them, I know of your physical and social and economical and religious persecution and pain. I know that you've been ostracized. I know that you're outcast. I know that you've been verbally assaulted and boycotted and physically mistreated. He says, I know of your poverty. Your shops have been vandalized and looted. And no one wishes to do business with you because of your faith in me. But listen, church, you are rich. You're spiritual rich are more than your material poverty. He says, I know of how you've received persecution on both ends. You've received persecution from the Romans and he also adds in, I know that there are some Jews who are not truly Jews at all because they slander you for saying that I'm not the Christ. They're not truly Jews. They are of Satan himself. And Jesus says to them, hide. Does he say that? Jesus says to them, relax. Does he say that? Does Jesus say to them, give up? Does He say that at all? No, He says, fear not. Be faithful. Jesus doesn't say, relax. Jesus, Jesus doesn't say that, that we need to just calm down. Jesus doesn't say that our troubles are over. Jesus doesn't say, you made it. The Apostle Paul actually alluded to the reality that, that in life you may have persecution and struggles and attacks from Satan and they may never go away until you get to heaven. Remember the Apostle Paul himself had, had a messenger of Satan that was constantly pricking his side, so to speak, a thorn in his flesh. And, and he asked the Lord, will you please remove this messenger of the devil himself? And God would remove it. Why wouldn't God remove it? So that Paul would look to the Lord in his weakness. 
This is a strong word for us today. Okay, the Lord doesn't say, you know what? They've been terrible to you. It's payback time. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't say it's time for you to retaliate and fight and get what's yours. Christians are not called to be on attack. Christians are called to be on guard. Christians are not called to fight flesh and blood. Christians are called to fight in the spiritual war. As a matter of fact, the Lord fights the war for you. Christians are not called to retaliate, but to let the Lord fight for us by His Word and Spirit. Christians are called to stand firm in the faith. And uphold the truth and share the hope that is found in Christ. And not be afraid how you respond to this day's circumstances. And what comes in the future reflects the state of your heart. Jesus doesn't tell them you've arrived or it's time for you to fight back. He actually says, brace yourself, more trouble is coming. He knew that the normal response, when you hear that trouble is coming, the normal response is to be afraid. He knew that such trauma uh, uh, and, and pain could result in paralysis and weakness and shying away from the faith. And that could ultimately lead to a great falling away of people. It's sad to say this, but, but we are seeing just that even in the circumstances we find ourselves. And, and folks, this is not persecution. Let's be honest. This is not what we're doing. Right. This is not persecution. We are though seeing a falling away. We are. People have used this circumstance in the pandemic and in the political pandemic that has followed followers of Jesus say, you know what? I don't need the Lord. I don't need the church, but I needed a way out. And this was an easy way out. And Satan loves that. He loves it. He loves to see the church displaced. He loves to see the church frazzled. He loves to see the church fractured. He loves to see the church disengaged. But Jesus says a word to Smyrna. He says, your real enemy, the devil, is about to throw some of you into prison. This is a test. It may be severe at times. It may hurt. But understand, whatever Satan may do to you, that is temporary. He says, some, not all, but he says, some of you would be thrown into prison but he does say, he does say in other places in Scripture, all of us will be tested. All of us will go through trials. But he says to this church, your testing will just last 10 days. Now, folks, that's not necessarily meaning a literal 10 days. This is just to show you that there's a limit to the time in which Christians will suffer. I know there's trouble, the Lord says. I know there's hurt. I know there's pain. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. Fear me, says the Lord. Not them. Look to me. Not them. Greater is the Lord Jesus within you than he who is in the world. Don't lose sight. Don't lose faith. Trust in me. Look to me. Notice that Jesus here doesn't say, just deal with the problems. No, Jesus is faithful. He is there and he's with you through the problems. Don't be afraid. I know that you may not want to hear that your trials are over, but they're not yet. I know that you wish the worst has come and gone, but the worst has yet to come. But regardless of the journey, Christ is with us through the crisis. Christ is with us through the trials. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, I will not abandon you. I will not forsake you. Even in death, even if it costs you your life, I will give you the crown of life. What is he talking about? He's talking about eternal life. I will give you life abundant. Folks, the worst thing that could happen to us is not death. The worst thing that could happen to a Christian is they fall away. Is that they lose heart. Is that they become ineffective. If we die, we go to heaven, folks. Praise God! <laughs> when we go to our home, there, there's far worse that can happen to the Christian than death. Death is just a passageway into freedom from the suffering and poverty and slander. Be strengthened in the Lord. Are you looking to Christ? Are you looking to yourself? Are you looking to someone else or something else? To build your faith and truth upon. I'll close with this point. Christ followers understand the loyalty they're to have to Jesus Christ. So I want you to take a look at, uh, at verse 11 as we close out today. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you have ears today, this message is intended for you. He's saying, listen up. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Loyalty to Jesus means a promise of hope 
and a promise of reward. You, you know, I love, I love the ministry of Charles Spurgeon. He lived two centuries ago. He's the prince of preachers, they call him. And, and he only lived for about 55 years. Charles Spurgeon uh, uh, lived his life for, for Christ in every single way, never wasted a second. The man uh, preached to over 10 million people in his short life. And he preached as many as 10 times a week Okay, in his prime, when you put all of the works of Charles Spurgeon that he's written together, they total 25 million words. No, no man on the planet has ever written more for Christian literature than Charles Spurgeon. Well, he had a plaque in his bedroom that quoted Isaiah 48, 10 that says, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. And, and, and Charles Spurgeon responded to this, reflected on this, and he says, it's not a mean thing to be chosen of God. God's choice makes chosen men choice men. We're chosen not in the palace. We're chosen in the furnace. In the furnace, beauty is marred, fashion is destroyed, strength is melted, glory is consumed. Yet the eternal love reveals its secrets and declares its choice. In affliction, in the furnace, that's where true love is found. Now, I understand that the church of Smyrna may not have always felt so called or felt so chosen or so special in the times in which they lived and the circumstances that they faced. But Jesus says to them, be fearless, be faithful. I will reward you. He says to those who overcome, to those who overcome, the Greek word for overcome means to prevail. The Greek word for overcome means to win one's cause. The Greek word for overcome means to be victorious in different and difficult circumstances. And so here in this text, it means persevere. It means step out. It means stand up. It means you are victorious, not just an identity. Because listen, we're, if you're in Christ today, if you know Jesus, you already are an overcomer in Christ. But it's not just an identity. It's also an opportunity. He says, if you stay faithful, if you stay loyal, you will not be hurt by the second death. You know what that means? This is the first time in Scripture second death is ever mentioned. It refers to the destiny of the unsaved after their bodily resurrection. Now, Revelation points to the reality that there's a future judgment coming. All the living, all the dead, so to speak, those who are in Christ, those who are without Christ, will be raised to life, so to speak, for, for the judgment. Okay, Those who are in Christ Jesus, you will not face a second death. The second death is eternity in hell. The second death is, is to be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Due to what? Due to unbelief in Christ. The promise here that Jesus makes to these believers in Smyrna is no matter the persecution you face, no matter the heartache and the hurt that you encounter, no matter what you endure as the church, I have promised a time and a place for eternity that you will never experience death again. I will give you life even though you're tried in the fire, God is purifying you. God is humbling you. God is perfecting you. God is producing in you patience and hope and faith. And He's preparing you for a life to come with Him in glory. And so Jesus says to His church, then and today, you be loyal. Follow Jesus. Live as an overcomer. Don't let those sinners mess you up. Don't let those folks who are going down keep you from maximizing on what the reward is for you that is up. Don't forsake your loyalty and, and faithfulness to me. Look to me. Trust in me. Be faithful unto me. I will strengthen you. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. You can't audit the Christian life, folks. Our job as the church is not to have services, but to make committed, faithful, loyal disciples who are not ashamed to say Jesus is Lord, who are not ashamed to say I'm not ashamed of the gospel. How are we to do it in 2020? We're to do it well. We're, we're to live out our talk. Walk our talk. We're to do it lovely. We're to do it compassionately. We're to do it willingly. We're to do it wisely. We're to do it appropriately. But make no mistake about it. The Christian in the 21st century, in the year 2020, we're to do it clearly. We've decided to follow Jesus. The cross has, has the cross in the empty tomb has drawn the line, so to speak. And I'm not turning back. God has been faithful. 
And He will be faithful to you through it all. The question is today, will you be loyal and faithful unto Him? Will you trust in Him? I know, folks, that we're imperfect, we're fallen people, but we trust in a perfect and faithful God who gives you strength, who gives you power, who gives you wisdom to help in your times of trouble. And so John says to this church, do not give up, beloved. Keep looking to Jesus. He's with you. He will help you. He knows where you are. He'll give you hope. His grace is sufficient. And He's given you everything you need to overcome. And it began and it ended at the cross. Be faithful. Be faithful even unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to praise you and I want to thank you and I want to publicly declare you as Lord and Savior of my life. I am thankful, God, for everything that you did to be Savior, to be Lord, to be God. You, you didn't have to do any of it to, to prove that. You didn't have to go to the cross. You didn't have to go to the tomb to prove that you were Lord. You already are. But in love, in grace, you saw us in our broken state. You saw us in our sin. You saw how, how afflicted we were. You saw how wayward we were. You saw how rebellious we were. You saw how sinful we were. And you, Father, came down to us through your Son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sins. So that we have opportunity today to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is God. And I worship Him. God, I'm thankful for the gift of grace. I am thankful unto you for salvation. I'm thankful unto you for hope. I'm thankful, God, that no matter what happens in 2020 or in 2021, no matter what may happen on, on the world scheme of things in this, in this country, no matter who's in charge, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who has leadership, I know Jesus is Lord of all. And I worship you, God, and I, and I proclaim your name, and I thank you. I thank you that there is hope alone in Jesus. God, I pray for the church this morning. I am praying heavily for the church that they would not be distracted, that they would not be discouraged, that they would not even feel or sense defeat. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is still in control. We still have a commission. We still have a great calling. We still have been set apart for, for gospel purposes. We still have opportunity to be the church. The church's mission has not changed over the last week. You are still in command. You are still sovereign. You are not surprised. You are not flabbergasted in the least by what, by what men have decided this week. You got the Lord. And I pray that Christians would act like it. I pray that we would believe like it. I pray that we would live like it. I pray that we would be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus in this life. For we hope in the life to come. And I pray that when people see us, when the world sees us, Father, I pray they see the Son of God within us. I pray they see the passion and the zeal and the fire. Not for ourselves, not even for the church, but for the glory of God. They would see in our demeanor. They would see in our attitude. They would see in our joy. They would see in our love. They would see in our commitment. Their faithfulness. They would see Christ. Who loved us and gave himself for us. I pray for the church, God. I, I pray that you would revive your church this morning. I pray that you would awaken your church this morning. I pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged today to stay faithful to the task as you have called us. Father, this morning as we pray, I, I want to pray for those that may not today be able to declare Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is King, Jesus is God. I pray for those today who've never had a personal relationship with Christ. And, and, and God, I pray this morning that they realize that right where they are, right where they're sitting, wherever they're listening, they have an opportunity right now to say Jesus is Lord. I worship you. I follow you. I declare allegiance upon Christ alone. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith, your trust in Christ, I want you to understand something. God so loved the world. He loves you. He gave His Son Jesus for you. 
We were sinful. We, we, we were without hope. We were without help. And God sent Jesus to pay the price for your sins today. Do you understand that? Do you acknowledge in this moment, yes, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I need to be forgiven. I need to be redeemed. Understand, that's why Jesus came. Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins. He was raised to life, glorious life, three days later, to proclaim victory, to give you eternal life. If you would just place your faith, your trust, your hope in Him. And that's it. That's it. In this moment, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, right now, you can declare, Jesus, I, I, I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I turn from them and I put my trust in you. And I will follow you as Lord and Savior of my life. If in this time of invitation, you need to come forward and say, I'm, I'm declaring Jesus is Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. If this morning God is moving in your heart to respond to this message, maybe you just need to come to, to this altar and, and, and just pray and just seek the Lord's face. Maybe this morning you need to do as one did in the 830 service and say, I, I'm, I'm committing my life, recommitting my life to you, God, to be faithful unto you. Please be obedient. Father, that's all I ask is that your people would be obedient today. Upon your word in Jesus' name, amen. William, if you don't mind, just, just play something for a moment. If someone would like to respond to this message in any way, if there's something on your heart that I can minister to you with, if I can pray for you in any way, you feel free to come. You feel free to come.